Good afternoon, and excuse me if you interrupt in your lunch, but please continue to eat. Um, that's a very important tradition at, at noon. And I will try not to, um, uh, to talk longer than necessary to um, have an, enough time for debating and discussion. Um, when I became mayor in 2010, it was now nine. I had the, the honor to meet, to meet a lot of people working in the port of Rotterdam, which is the largest port in, 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 in Europe, um, serving uh, 500 million consumers, um, therefore a small country of 16 million citizens, uh, a port that plays a prominent role in the European economy. Uh, so someone with German roots here? I try not to offend anyone, but maybe. Um, the reason that I'm asking that question is that, um, and that's truth, what I'm going to say, um, no Mercedes without the port of Rotterdam. All iron ore needed for the steel industry in Germany is transshipped in Rotterdam, not in Hamburg. All coal that is needed for making steel or for coal-fired power stations is transshipped in Rotterdam. So Germany is um, heavily served from the port of Rotterdam. I think 70% of all the goods arriving in Rotterdam are, um, have the main destination in Germany. So it's really important. But it's the same port that is producing nowadays 17% of the national volume of pollution. 17%, one seven. Um, together with Houston, where uh, one of the largest petrochemical sites in the world, with uh, five major refineries. Shell is one of the biggest. BP is there, total, and some smaller refineries. So it's um, a major hub for the economy, but also one of the biggest polluters. So um, in terms of transforming the carbon-oriented economy to something different, for my city, that's not a question. It's more the question how to do that and how quick can we do that. It's not a fundamental question. It's more a pragmatic question. Knowing that all transitions will take time and that um, the period between uh, stopping a certain process um, oriented on, on carbon and starting another one, that the time in between, that's what we call the transition time. So you hear perfectly that in engineering speaking to you. And the shorter it is, the transition time, the better it is for the economy. And let me explain you why I do really believe and work hard on that issue. Because I also believe that the economy and the jobs are to be protected. Do you have an idea why humanity 
moved from the Stone Age, when we have, the economy was based on working with stones, to steam, when James Watt discovered for the first time his steam machine, making that movement. And the Dutch were the first to transform that horizontal movement in that movement. Do you know why? We needed pumps to dry the polders. So we moved from the stones to the steam, and not because there is a lack of stones in the world. So people that tend to say, we have to preserve our economy based on carbon because there is still a lot of gas and oil and, and, and coal on Earth, they are right. There is a huge volume on that. There is one complicated issue. Humanity don't want it anymore. Our citizens don't want it anymore. So we have to make that change. And the quicker we move towards that new stadium, the healthier it is for the economy. I'm really aware that if you talk to a lot of people working in that sector, making steel based on carbon, or producing power made based on coal, they will say, please, this is my job, I don't want to lose it. But exactly the same people must be told, if you focus only on that, that is like Napoleon, who is focusing on the former war. And it's easy to prepare for the former war. There's one thing with the former war, you never win it. It's already passed. So we have to prepare for the next, it's not the right word, I should say the next revolution, and that is a revolution going on. So governments should not say to citizens, yeah, you are right, your job, it's really important, we will try to protect you by building walls on our cities or on our nations because the threat is coming from elsewhere. You may do that, but there's a form of war. All writings about Napoleon can teach you that it's not the right approach. It's better to be in the lead of that transition. And there is really a revolution going on. I don't have my phone with me. I gave it to the Consul General just to empty my pockets. That is what I learned when I was a journalist. But that machine, which is really sophisticated, has an economic life cycle of about two years, three years, maybe three years, and then it's over. We have fantastic engineers that are making that type of machines. They are maybe 30, 28, and suddenly they are 35, 40, and the knowledge become obsolete. A new revolution is coming in. Can you imagine that we have engineers on the age of 40 that we stand with punch and say goodbye, you're finished? That is a revolution going on. And that starts not with ideological talk about building walls and protection, it starts with what do you do to build a smart, help me, a, a smart, not a smart city, a smart city doesn't exist, a smart citizen. So we are, if I have in my budget 10 euros to spend, and I have no democracy to control me, so I will be the only and one ruler in my city, and I have to spend 10 dollars or 10 euros, help me, I will spend the first euro on education. So it's up to you now. I will spend the second euro on health, and the third euro on housing. Wrong. I will spend the first one on education, the second one on education, and the third one on education. That ma makes a smart civilization. Smart people build bridges and can go easily in that revolution to uh, avoid obsolete knowledge and create a permanent cycle of building new knowledge to make the civilization going on. Do we do, we do that? Do we spend $3 out of a budget for education? It's up to you to answer. So smart cities don't exist. What exists are smart citizens. That's why the policy of the city of Rotterdam is really focusing on that issue. It's really a complicated approach. There is not a, 
and a single solution. Politicians are always interested in the magic solution. Tell me, can you give me an advice? If I push that button, then we have the solution for the city. It's not going to work. That doesn't exist. Everything is complex. Everything is complex. So when we talk about climate issues, Rotterdam is, um, is, has a wonderful relation with water. Our port is based on the river, so it's our economy. The port is built on the river, but it's also our enemy, flooding. Eastern Rotterdam is minus six meters below sea level. Minus six meters below sea level. The technology that we des designed there for building dikes and levees is now transferred to New Orleans as they needed desperately to build a, a kind of um, a, a, a sea protection system. So we have the danger of water. We have the danger of pollution, but also part of the solution. Um, all the Netherlands is wired with gas pipelines. All the houses are connected to gas. But we now decide, decided to stop um, um, gaining gas in the northern part of the, of the country. It's going to zero. It's causing a lot of geological problems over there. Well, I said to the government, you stop gas. I have part of the solution, hot water coming from the port of all these refineries as a residue. Nowadays, we dump it in the river, killing fish. So we built a pipeline from the port, from these refineries, where we catch the hot water, bring it to a neighborhood in Rotterdam to connect these houses to hot water. You may see it's energy for free. Although there is marginal cost with pipe, building pipelines and all this stuff. So Rotterdam is now working to disconnect the houses from gas and to transport heat from the port and connect that to the houses. And a lot of people say, if we focus on this climate issue, we will lose jobs. Be aware. So count with me. If I decide to work on my house from the perspective of climate, I will, first of all, insulate my house. Then I will put solar on the roof. I will change the cables home try to charge the battery of my car, the, the, the car with, um, uh, with my uh, energy provided from, from the solar systems. I will store the overcapacity in a kind of a hydrogen tank, not batteries anymore. That's the technology 2018. Hydrogen tanks, uh, we will um, use the water, the rainwater, and filter it to the degree that I can drink it, and the remainings will be are put to the washing machine, we'll call it gray water, and um, all this stuff, it sounds abracadabra, but this reality. But did you count how many hands do I need to do this work? And do you have, no, have an idea how many people in Rotterdam I desperately need for such a simple job? Digging in the ground, putting the pipelines, connecting the pipelines, covering it again, draw new cables, put the solar systems on the roofs. That is work and opportunities for thousands and thousands of my citizens over 30 years. That is how long it would take to do the job in the city of Rotterdam. Do the math for Chicago. So the ones that say the climate approach is costly and will lead to dissolving existing jobs they are not telling the whole truth. To me, working on climate issues equals working on the new economy equals creating new jobs. Thank you. I had 50 minutes, it's a 14. Thank you, Mayor Abu Talib, and welcome to Chicago. Um, I know this is your second visit as mayor. I was there in the Netherlands when you were here, so I didn't have a chance to uh, welcome you then, but we're happy that you made the stop. I know you're on your way to San Francisco. Um, when you became mayor 10 years ago, um, was Rotterdam already uh, viewed as an innovation hub, or has this really been something you have uh, been committed to? I think it was by then started. Um, 
the first one to start with installing the so-called Rotterdam Climate Initiative was the former mayor who picked up the idea in London and then he went back to Rotterdam and asked the former Prime Minister, uh, Ruth Lubbers, who died unfortunately a couple of months ago, to start the Rotterdam Climate Initiative, which is a collaboration between sciences, the businesses and the city of Rotterdam to set the first steps towards what I'm talking about. And you have, um, the city has some really spectacular architecture, which I think uh, some of which were shown during the lunch, although we had our back to the screens. Um, has there's, how has it been that um, such innovative architects have come uh, to the city? And does the city uh, require now special um, accommodations for, for climate change yeah. uh, when in design? You know, the, um, the city is a progressive city. It was led by social democrats since the war, with an exception of two terms. Um, and one of these progressive approaches was embracing the change. And um, we had, um, by accident, the war, the Second World, Second World War, um, that was leading to demolishing downtown Rotterdam, completely burned um, with lucky enough, less casualties than we're now commemorating today with 9-11. Um, was in New York some, some 3,000 casualties. Rotterdam was 1,000 casualties, but the surface that was burned by the bombing was tremendous. So there was a lot of empty space, um, and the engineers and the city um, government tried to come up with a new idea to build a modern city instead of building the old one. So that's the difference between Amsterdam and Rotterdam. Amsterdam is not bombarded. So when you go to Amsterdam, you see what I call, or the former mayor was angry when I said that, a kind of an open-air museum um, with a lot of tiny little houses um, around the canals, very fascinating, uh, that attracts millions and millions of, uh, of visitors. But the city of Rotterdam, they decided by then to build a modern city. Um, and they gave chance for new architects to build really modern things, um, and, and the sky is the limit. So that gives a lot of opportunities again. One of the largest buildings in Europe is the Rotterdam. That is a huge building uh, next to the bridge, Erasmus Bridge. You may see it, I think, on the pictures. Um, the air conditioning, for instance, is based on fresh water coming from the river. So the, the, the natural resource is the water coming from the river used for, climate, um, for solving climate issues in the building. So yes, indeed, it gives uh, some, uh, some, some new opportunities. Um, I think one of the, the photos was of the, the building I call the smog eating building. Yeah. How, did, how did that happen? And what, and what, what is it? How does it work? Um, again, you give space to the developers uh, and to the architects and, and um, they are free to come up with new proposals, new combinations and, that's, and the city really likes that and embrace new initiatives. Um, so uh, we sometimes find combined solutions for complicated issues. We have a parking problem in the city, so we needed parking garages, but we don't want uh, cars parked at the surface of the, um, of the streets. So we banned 6,000 parking lots. Can you do that in Chicago? <laughs> 6,000 parking lots just skipped uh, above the ground, and we created uh, more parking um, um, garages. We paid for that as a city. We make parking at the street level very expensive, and you may park in the city garage for two dollars a week, uh, uh, an hour, so that is a, a policy um, a change. But underneath the garages, which is really sophisticated, we have a water basin that we use to store the water uh, when there is a lot of rain and that the sewage system cannot have it. Mm -hmm. So we we um, capture the water there for a period, wait the river to 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 get down, and when the level of the river is going down, then we pump the water over the dike to the river. So that's why we needed pumps. Um, when you travel downtown Rotterdam at the Versa Single, which is a wonderful place um, to, to walk, at the end of the, uh, of the street you may find at the, at the right hand a beautiful old building that looks like a villa. But when you enter the, the building, you will find uh, three big diesel machines uh, dealing with water in the city, pumping that into the, um, into the river. And that guy over there, he's responsible for uh, doing all the work. 
So, so were you saying that the bottom level of the parking, underground parking, is used for water retention during Correct. During Millions of, mil of liters of water is stored over there. When there's overflow. Yeah. Otherwise, it's parking. Uh, no, it's, uh, that, <laughs> that space is uh, designated. Below. Yeah, it's, it's below. Oh. It's designated for that. And in 2011, we are the most stupid city council, I think, in the world to pay for a facility to store the water outside the city border. I mean, in, from a democratic point of view, it's not possible that your citizens allow you to finance a project outside the city border, which we did. And that is a combination of a rowing lane with Olympic dimensions and a water storage facility for the city. So try to um, use space double or sometimes three times to give it more functions. So, so what is the new energy plan and what, what's the commitment in that plan? It's a very comprehensive thing. It's um, building houses in a way that it's sustainable, like I was talking about, um, making possible that all these neighborhoods um, will be uh, accessible by public transport, including the last kilometer, which is the most complicated thing, to, how to do that. Um, and we would like to build in the, um, in the inner circle of downtown because that we may have a lot of houses without building new infrastructure. If you build a neighborhood outside the city, then you have to bring a metro line there, a, a tram, a bus, build school, and there are a lot of social um, things that you have to create there. And these things stay for the entire life on the budget of the city. But if you increase the capacity of the city using the same existing infrastructure, we still have wonderful infrastructure that is not used for 100%, then it will be beneficial, I think, to keep the prices low and the taxes low for the, uh, for the citizens. Um, the other thing is, um, uh, the Port Authority is linked to the city, so it's our port. And the President is now working on building a huge pipeline in the port, bringing um, uh, CO2 emissions that we capture from the refineries, make them liquid first, and pump them through this pipeline to bridge a distance of 60 kilometers into the North Sea and bring these CO2 emissions to the former gas fields in the North Sea. Um, which is a fascinating, uh, innovative project that we're now um, going to finance together with the European Commission and the Dutch government. And the major refineries are committed um, to um, be linked to this pipeline. Um, that is a very important first step uh, for the years ahead. Um, and a couple of weeks ago, I was visiting um, Western Germany, and I had the honor to meet the Prime Minister of the Nord Rhine-Westphalia. as the place where the German industry is a uh, Accumulated, and I offered him the possibility to be linked to this pipeline. Uh, in the beginning, if you make CO2 emissions um, liquid, you might put it in a barge and then bring it through the Rhine Canal to Rotterdam and then put it on the pipeline. But in the long term, it will be, I think, prof um, profitable for Germany to connect with us through a pipeline from North, North Rhine-Westphalia. So it's, um, it's really a, a sophisticated thing. You have a, a specific goal to reduce emissions yeah. by, by 2050? Yeah. And what, what is that goal? Uh, that is the Paris Agreement, 49%. And you will do it? Yeah. We, 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 <laughs> if we don't succeed that, I don't know who, who else can do it. How far along, how far along are you, would you say, in, in the Well, not that far. Um, the, um, the first plus is minus 2%. Um, we used to be 19% polluter in the Netherlands. We're now 17%. The first coal-fired power session is closed. And we're moving towards closing a second um, uh, to, other, um, uh, to other power stations. Um, and the, the, the construction of such a CO2 pipeline will contribute tremendously. And that construction side would take two, three years. So it's really uh, very soon. Um, I think we were talking about how um, you're also burning waste on the, on the port or in the port. Yeah. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Um, thanks to the, uh, we burn um, trash in the Netherlands because it's not allowed by law uh, to dump it. Um, so we, we burn that and there is overcapacity in the ovens in Rotterdam. 
That's why we are also burn trash coming from Great Britain and from Italy. So there is, there is overcapacity in doing that. And that's indeed, um, this process is producing hot water. So you, we use this hot water for the purpose I described in my, uh, in my uh, introduction remarks. And it's also producing electricity. So um, uh, one bag of trash is good for three minutes of shower. One bag. Yeah. One bag. So burning one bag of trash equals three minutes shower. This uh, is this is after recycling everything. Yeah, after recycling. Be, yeah. You're, not, you're not burning. Yeah, everything. we're not burning everything. No, we're not and, burning everything. And um, is there some concern about pollutants that come out of the the burning uh, equipment? Well, of course, such an oven produces CO2 emissions, and partly uh, is cleaned because CO2 emission. Uh, emissions, if they are cleaned, they are, are a healthy product for something else. So we have a pipeline coming from there to the Westland, and the Westland is a big area with, um, where we produce vegetables um, under glass constructions, you may know that. Um, so uh, clean CO2 emissions is a healthy product to grow plants um, in, this, in this area. And these farmers are now asking for more CO2 in a clean form. So one of the uh, companies that will be linked to such a pipeline to transport the emissions to the North Sea is this burning installation. That's terrific. Um, can you speak to some of the other innovations in the newer buildings in the city that have, have been uh, come online recently? Well, the, um, um, I have been visiting a number of innovations led by TNO and the Technical University of Delft um, that is a new construction, a new way of construction houses. It's, it's really fascinating that the total amount of energy that they n need in such a house is coming from alternatives. The total amount of energy. Um, so that's, of course, an experiment. So if we want to upscale that to a higher level, that will be a next um, uh, endeavor. I'm leading um, what we call a national program, Rotterdam South, that is an area where uh, people with small wallets are living. Um, in the beginning, mainly people coming from Brabant and Zeeland to work in the port, domestic migration, and nowadays people from elsewhere in the world. Um, 35,000 houses, one way or another, will be touched. And um, I'm lucky to say to you we have funding for that, we can do that. Um, partly is funding into the system, partly coming from outside the system. Sometimes it's um, um, contribution from the city and sometimes contribution from the national government. That's why it's called national program. And it's there we would like to upscale this product of building this type of houses that is um, um, completely disconnected from the grid, from the grid and from the gas pipeline. So there will be a standalone um, um, house that is taking care of, of its own. Um, there is a lot of um, facilities uh, that we can do that. And I would like also to experiment with um, using other technology to make these sometimes little tiny houses not only accessible for the elderly, but to equip them with such a, a new devices that uh, the elderly can survive on their own for a long time. Uh, with domotica, but also with other type of, um, of, uh, of innovation. And add to that, and that's really not less important, social innovation. Um, healthcare, for instance, for the elderly, is a government thing in the Netherlands. Um, and it costs nowadays so, um, a third of the national budget. It's a huge amount of money. Uh, more than 100 billion euros for a, for a country with 16 million citizens, it's a lot of money. But you need also a social uh, transition uh, to have a different look on, on healthcare. It means that a lot of um, work that is now done by nurses and other type of professionals easily can be done by the neighbors. So can we engage neighbors or other people living in the neighborhood to, uh, to help in that process, also to get a little paid, but not the salary of a nurse? That is a thing that I would like to copy from Oslo. Uh, I have been witnessing this system in Oslo. Um, you may have uh, cameras in such a studio where your parents are living, you are in Paris, and you can access the cameras with your father and mother and see how the, the well-being is. Uh, and they are allowed to 
um, give you the authority to, to watch and the others are not. So um, not only the physical um, and the, um, uh, the climate issues that can be involved, but also um, social innovation, which is not less important as, as the physical aspects. Would you say the community has as, as strong a commitment to the climate innovations as you do? You know, there are two things in the city from which I think that the citizen, if I ask them whether they support me in doing that, the answer will be, Mayor, don't bother me. That is the climate issue, and that is the water resiliency. It's too complicated um, to enter in a complicated debate with ordinary citizens. You can't get that issue uh, through that type of debate. But citizens have a high degree of trust. And they say, um, city government, council, mayor, you are there elected to take care of us. Uh, we pay taxes. Don't bother us. Do it. And um, I have an experience once that I went to a group of elderly people in the eastern part of Rotterdam a couple of years ago. Um, a group maybe double of this size. And I tried to joke with them and told them, uh, nice to be here with you and uh, um, the place in the city where we have a huge security problem. What? Security problem? We have no idea. When they talk about security, they think about policing and law enforcement, that type of issues. But they forget that they are living minus six meters below sea level. <laughs> minus six meters. And sometimes I, uh, another joke, so really a joke, say um, the responsibles in the city government those years have been responsible for allowing housing constructions there must face justice. It's amazing, minus six meters. But we have high dikes and levees. The water is here and the dike is here, 50 or 60 centimeters. And then you stand on the dike, six meters there, you see the cows and the housing. That's the Netherlands. But people say, we have wonderful dikes. We pay taxes through the years. They are strong enough. Nobody in the world can construct dikes and levees like we do that in the Netherlands. That's our existence. May it don't bother me, I feel safe. But a dike, even if it is constructed, statistically to break down once in 100 years, might break down tomorrow. But people don't feel the danger. They believe really that we are safe behind the dikes. Um, and, what, and what about the... Um... So it's not a sexy issue. That's the, 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 the yeah. word. It's not a sexy issue to talk about. Um, maybe they would like to talk about a, a, a subject in one of the popular newspapers more than, than the mayor who is coming to warn them for water. But what, what about, or maybe you can talk a little bit about the uh, storm barrier in the, in the port or in the, in the river that was built after 1952. Well, floods. first, um, I was happy really um, to be asked by the national government five years ago to lead uh, a think tank to rethink the water um, safety in Rotterdam region, which is not only the port. And so two things were, were there, uh, were put on the table. Are our dikes and levees strong enough? Are they high enough? Um, that's one thing. And the other thing is um, how to deal with fresh water. You cannot imagine that we, have, we will have a problem of fresh water in the Netherlands. We have one of the pipelines for drinking water in Rotterdam that's not far from Gouda. People who know the geography of the Netherlands, that's about 70 kilometers to the North Sea. But that source is closed 90 days a year because of salt influence coming from the North Sea. So it's a high influence on, on that. You are lucky to have a wonderful lake here, take care of it. Um, but we have an influence of, uh, of, of the North Sea into our drinking water system. The two main questions. Um, one um, answer was, well, our dikes are good, but maybe for security reasons we will raise that level with 40 or 50 centimeters. Do you imagine what it is? Thousands of kilometers of dikes to be incremented with 40 or 50 centimeters? We did the math. It's about 100 billion euros for the total dikes length in the Netherlands. 100 billion euros to do so. 
But there was a smarter solution. We call it give the river the space. And that cannot be done in Rotterdam because that is an urban area. So where, where else? Down, to, down the river to Maastricht. So that means um, a lot of spaces in other regions in the Netherlands cannot be used for agriculture or can be used for construction houses. Give the river space. That is cheaper than a lot of money in Rotterdam to raise the dikes. So we decide not to do that that way. But one of the other things is we have a huge arm that is uh, working hydraulically to close the river when there is high water coming from um, the mountains of Switzerland and France. That water is concentrated in Rotterdam. It's coming through the river going to the sea. And if there is a high wind coming from uh, the North Sea, uh, then the waves will be to a certain degree. And then it's calibrated on when it will be three meters. Then we close the arm to protect the dikes. It's not protecting the industry. People are wrong. We close the arm to reduce the pressure on the dikes so they cannot break. And we do that not that often. We exercise that arm twice a year to see what is working. And it's a joint decision between the Minister of Transport, Environment, and the Mayor of Rotterdam together. We take the decision together. And once we say close it, based on the uh, environmental uh, um, um, rain forecast and things like that, someone pushed the bottom and it's closed. And we're now part of that decision that we have been doing last five years. We're constructing another one, parallel to the, um, to the existing river. Really, we talk about the river. It's not the river. It's man-made. It's more a canal. But the, the original river, it's really a bit to the south. And on that part of the water system, a new arm will be constructed. How, how big is the existing arm that closes off the river? So I think it crosses, um, crosses some 60 meters or 70 meters. 60 meters? Um, 60, 70, something like that. I don't have the dimensions. You may see it on, 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 your, on, your, uh, on, your, uh, on your iPad. If you look on Google for water barrier, Rotterdam, you can see it. It's a huge thing. Bigger, as big as the Eiffel Tower. Okay. The Consul General has the dimensions. Okay. Yeah. I live there. Yeah, he lived there. Okay. Um, are the, is there a focus on converting uh, the government buildings into, into renewable energy as well? Is that a first step or a part of the bigger plan? Well, in Rotterdam, we have the, 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 the buildings of the city. Uh, we schools. Own, the schools, for instance. We own the, the schools. There is a program which we run with a, together with a pension fund. To, um, um, well, that's not the issue when you construct new uh, uh, schools, but with, to insulate existing um, buildings. And we're working on it together with the pension fund. There is a whole program for it. I think an investment program of 250 million euros, something like that. That's a lot. That's a lot of money, yeah, um, in the long term. So what is, what is the floating farm or floating houses <laughs> that you are talking about? Well, yesterday we made uh, the world known that we are going to build um, a floating office for Ban Ki-moon. Uh, Ban Ki-moon um, uh, will be the president of the uh, Global Climate uh, Adaptation Center in Rotterdam. And um, he is coming to come to the Netherlands October 16th. And after a meeting with His Majesty, he will announce his new job. Uh, but we know it, and you know it with uh, in the board of that institute also Bill Gates. Um, so we together will be, um, I hope that that institute will be a kind of an OECD for climate issues. Uh, a group of scientists that make tailor-made tailor solutions for cities or regions in the world. So you come with your questions and that will be processed and they produce an advice to you how to do that. And I said to the uh, the CEO of the institute last week when we had an inauguration meeting in my office, that's not enough. Because the work I did, for instance, with Jakarta or with um, um, Ho Chi Minh City, providing them um, knowledge, assistance from the city of Rotterdam, it stops when you can find finances to realize that. So that global institute should also help cities and sometimes states or countries to get uh, access to international funding. Otherwise, things are not going to work. Uh, Jakarta needs a freshwater drinking system. 
They don't have that. Can you imagine? Jakarta has no drinking water system. Everybody is digging for his own water in the city. So by that, the city is shrinking every year at six, seven centimeters. And that causes a lot of flooding. Two times flooding a year is um, a damage of billions and billions of euros. So we have to do something about, about that and get cities access to, um, to, uh, to resources. Uh, so that's really a, a fundamental um, thing. I hope that they will move towards, towards a kind of an OCD for, for, um, uh, for, for, climate, uh, for climate approach. Um, so that's, to me, a very important signal that Rotterdam will be a kind of uh, hard uh, for debates in the world about uh, uh, adaptation because a lot of cities in the world are focusing on mitigation. So uh, when you ask cities in, in the world, what are you doing something about climate, they say, yes, we have electric buses. But electric buses is not the answer. Um, it's part of the answer, but it's not the only it's answer. It's a very small answer. Yeah. Um, the complicated decisions are linked with special planning, are linked to water management. So there are really tough decisions how to deal with your space. Uh, and if there is space scarcity in downtowns of a lot of, uh, of cities, if you would like to build a water plaza like we did, a water plaza to catch the water um, during times of heavy rain, um, that means you need space. But to do that. Um, and, and space downtown is always expensive uh, space, and most of times not government owned. So you have to do something with, uh, with it. So I, I really hope that that institute will put the issue of adaptation uh, on the agenda, primarily because we human beings are weak and we cannot win for Mother Nature. So it's really important, I think, to get adapted to the requirements of the nature instead of thinking that we can win from, uh, from Mother Nature. So buildings um, can be transformed, can be uh, retrofitted, and invest in, um, that was um, Bill Clinton, I think, who did the math, constructing and retrofitting buildings for a volume of 1 billion euros gives more working opportunities than building a power plant, a coal-fired power plant for the same volume of money. So it's again, uh, what type of war do you want to win? The former one or the next one? So back to, back to the floating building. Is it really going to be floating? Yeah, that will be floating. Yeah, we have an existing floating building. Uh, the farm uh, will be a floating farm. Um, do you have an idea what the tide is in Rotterdam? The tide? Even if it is 40 kilometers out of the coast, it's two meters. Wow. The daily average is two meters. Between 8 o'clock in the evening and 4 o'clock and in the morning, two, two meters. So the, uh, Mr. Ban Ki-moon will have his office in a floating office, I promise. It's interesting, very interesting. Um, well, I'm going to ask one more last question, and then we're going to open it up for the questions from the audience, and that is money. How, how, how is all of this financed? Well, my pocket is empty. Yeah. Um, what, what, what's the, the uh, relationship of participation and how this is financed? People who say there is no money, they, they're really joking. There is a lot of money in the world. The question is, do we spend it wisely? That's, I think, the issue. There is a lot of money. It's about taking decisions um, properly. That's what I said um, when I was telling you what to do with 10 dollars or 10 euros. It's a matter of making choices. Just making choices. Um, but do you need a, a national commitment for the adaptation to reach these goals? Sometimes yes, and sometimes no. You know, even in my country, there is a lot of space for ideological debate in the parliament. Today, again, a huge debate about ideological issues, pros and cons, and, and there they go. But let them do that. That's why I leave the national government to go to do practical things uh, on local government. Um, and I'm, I'm very happy also to hear from my colleagues in the US, and I know a couple of them. Some of them are active in the C40 um, organization, and some of them are um, working together with uh, the Bloomberg Foundation. And, um, and I meet a lot of them, and they are really keen and working on this issue. Whatever the national or federal policy is, they are really fo focusing on, on what we are, all mayors in the world are doing. That's why I'm going this afternoon to San Francisco, and there will be a huge meeting with, I think, some 2,000 uh, delegates from all over the world, and we will be discussing this very prominent issue. Um, so I, I do believe that 
we have to spend the money, uh, the money wisely and do, do the right things. Thank you. I have a question from, um, I think, our virtual audience, and that is, um, how does the right-wing political party or segment in the, in the country uh, relate to the, the climate change adaptations and costs? Um, a lot of words, no influence. That's what I should say. A lot of words, no influence. Because the, the national government is really uh, following the path of Paris. We are fully behind the Paris Agreement. That's, the, that's national politics. And of course, there are fractions in the parliament opposing that. That's the role of the opposition. That's why opposition has been founded in democracy. And in my city, there are also um, people that are opposing this idea. But the, the, in the city council, which is the highest body to our city, we have a highly decentralized system of government. The majority is in favor of this, of this path and embracing the Paris uh, Agreement. So we embrace nationally the Paris Agreement and we do that, we do that locally. And there is some skepticism when it comes to the right parties uh, in the Netherlands, but that is so far a matter of talking and saying we're against it more than that they have really an influence in the, um, in the, in the path that is followed now mm -hmm. by the national government. Um, it's now time to get uh, questions from our audience. I think, do we have microphones? Yeah. Um, so if you raise your hands, I'll recognize you and hopefully we'll get some microphones. Can we get one up here? Uh, Peter Lee. Yeah, just just to follow up on that last question, you know, a year and a half ago, you had an election, the far right lost, but they did gain seats, you know, almost double what they had. Just, can you look into the future? Are they going to continue to grow, or is it leveling off, you think? I should say even profits were not able to, to look into the future. Uh, so I cannot do that. Um, but if you ask me to make an analysis on, uh, on that, I really believe that there is um, um, still a fertile ground for extreme right in Europe. And I think that um, the total amount of influence will not increase dramatically. In the Netherlands, it's is, is coming down. Um, and I think that traditional political parties like mine, Labour, uh, must really um, um, rethink the fundamentals of our policy. Um, social democracy is built on solid solidarity, which is really a very important thing. But to what degree do you uh, exercise uh, solidarity and where do you exercise that in the, in the world? Uh, that are maybe um, questions to be, uh, to be, to be answered. Um, I'm left, but some people say to me, he is also a populist. And I think they are right. There are a lot of definitions of populism. Uh, populism, to me, is really dealing with the concerns of citizens, listening to citizens and taking care of the general voices. Um, and so that's why I visit a lot of neighborhoods in my city. You may find me once in two weeks in one of the neighborhoods, in person, leading meeting, meetings like, like this one, listening to all these voices. But standing in the middle there to listen to all these voices doesn't necessarily mean accommodating all these voices. So I take one or two issues with me back and said to the citizens, we have eight conclusions today, I take two, the other six are for you. Let's work together. That is another type of populism, doing, dealing with the major concerns. And no, it's also an answer. But not showing up in these neighborhoods and saying, well, that whole neighborhood is moving to the far right. That's not the right thing to do. So we have, as people like me, to regain these voices again, um, into the places where it's needed to make a social force. Um, and I can tell you my party, um, even my party is sometimes not accepting my way of dealing with issues. Um, when there was Charlie Hebdo, um, I had a live interview with one of the uh, important television programs. And it was live coming from my working room. And um, I was really angry, like all people I think in the world, so I said, uh, why do these criminals, that's what we call them, they are not Salafists or Islamists, they are criminals, so call them criminals. Why are these criminals um, unhappy with the French culture, with the French um, law and the whole system of freedoms, um, that these freedoms that gave a journalist or cartoonist the right to 
draw the drawings like they, 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 they want. Why do these people uh, unhappy go to Yemen, learn how to use a Kalashnikov, and then come to Paris to kill innocent citizens? They have had another choice, if you're unsatisfied. Pack your luggage, buy a ticket, and go to elsewhere in the world where you might have a decent place to live. And I added, maybe it's Afghanistan or Southern Sudan, a better place to be. Leave. Um, I'm sorry, I used some strong words for that. Uh, and it was live on television, so it was not a, um, an appropriate word, but I, that was exactly what I, my feeling of that moment. And um, a lot of people were happy with it. Uh, finally, someone from the politics is saying exactly what it is. Um, and I declared a day later, uh, I would never will use that word anymore, uh, but I'm not withdrawing it. It's exactly what I had the feeling of that moment. And I think that um, um, it's, I think, two bridges too far from civilized politicians to the left to do what I did. And I understand that because we have a heritage in dealing with the word solidarity. But excluding criminals and terrorists from the definition of solidarity, it's to me obvious. This is what I call the we society. And everyone who is using the violence to dictate in this circle what's, what is the common denominator deserve to be excluded. And then we push them aside. And the only thing, the only ones that can deal with them in the Netherlands, first is the mayor, responsible for public order and policing, and the other agency is the Secret Service. So I, I'm not soft for that type of citizens, but I'm soft for everybody else. Um, connect them to me as, as, uh, as easy as possible. That's why go to these neighborhoods. People may touch you. It's like I do. Sorry, Ambassador. Um, <laughs> they may uh, have the, the moment to be very angry and say things to you. And it's better to say that to me there than to use the votes and the vote wrongly in the voting room two years later. And I think that's the difference. So managing um, sentiments in society is to me a kind of populism, but a, a positive way of dealing with populism. And if we don't do that, the others will do that in a wrong manner. That's the difference. So you may call me a populist. Some people in the Netherlands tend also to say, he is also a Salafist, because I'm a Muslim and do my prayers a day, every day. So it's, it's a matter of words. But the Americans have the right, the right expressions for the ones who went to, um, to, to fight in the Middle East. Um, they are not Salafists or jihadists. They are terrorists. So call them terrorists. Um, and don't use the wrong words by which you push a majority of Muslims in the corner. And that's why I'm not doing it. And all these people, um, if you push them in the, in, in the corner, they have no words to participate in a debate. The only thing they can do, they say, well, this is my bag. If you continue to smash me, do it. And that's what's now happening in Europe. And unfortunately, we don't have an elite among the Muslims in Europe to participate in that debate because the, um, the people that have been looking to come to Europe to work were not the elites, were um, average immigrants. Um, and it takes a lot of generations in a family with carpenters to get a doctor. So that's, I think, the situation now. So we have to manage it as accepted politicians in a proper way. If we don't do it, we leave a lot of space for the others to do that wrongly. So is this why they call you controversial? Some <laughs> people do that, yes. Any question over here? Mr. Mayor, I'm just curious, what brought you and your family from Morocco to the Netherlands? Climate change. I discovered, really, that it is climate change. Um, I lived in a, on a mountain with some scattered houses, families, and we, the only protection we had was my grandfather, who was in the army. There was no government, there was no police, no gendarme. So the one to protect us was my grandfather with his rifle on the roof. He died in, th in 73. And we had a long period of no rain, no rain. I was the one in the family, 13 years old, on a donkey, 
to walk really kilometers to neighboring places to get 30 liters of drinking water and coming back to the family. We had small pieces of land to grow some potatoes. I can tell you, I know everything about growing potatoes. So that's maybe my next step in my career. Um, so growing potatoes and some small vegetables to survive, that's all. My father was by then an immigrant in Europe. So no water, no food, no security. What do you do? You live. So my father um, uh, requested the Dutch government to allow what they called this year a family re reunification. So he was looking for a house, and the Netherlands accepted his request, and we moved to the Netherlands in 1976, October 17th, 9 o'clock 30 in the morning. <laughs> so if there are historians here, that's it. Just write it. Yeah. So in, in that perspective, it's really a climate issue. Water and drought. Jack. Mayor, I was uh, part of a uh, group from Arcadis three years ago that toured Rotterdam. Amazing what you've done downtown, the rebirth of the city, and the innovations at the port. But with those innovations come less work for the blue collar employees. How will you train them? How are you getting them into the new economy? We started about doing our best. Uh, let me give you one little example. The second mass fluctor, that is a huge space. When you go there, you look to a distance, you think that you are in a desert. Very big distance, 2,000 hectares of land. New land. Our Brexit, so we said to the mayor of London, you built a wall behind London and we come to London by gaining land in the North Sea. So a huge space. And it's there where we introduced where the companies introduced uh, a type of um, machinery that is not operated anymore um, um, traditionally. It's completely robotized. Huge space, you see a lot of movement of vehicles, no people in it, but there is a heart behind it. So all these people that work, in the past we needed eight persons to serve one crane, and now zero people to serve one crane. But doesn't mean zero people, that's not the case. All these operators are working in a fascinating operations room using joysticks. So they're not in the crane, they are in an office space like this one. I'm expecting within a couple of years that even my mother will do the job from home. They have two monitors and they um, lift the containers, uh, stop them on these uh, robots, and the robots are, start writing. Approximately 60% of the jobs have been saved um, by learning these uh, operators that have been in the crane to work with joysticks and other things. But the port community is big. We have 100,000 jobs in the port, direct jobs, and more than 150,000 jobs linked to the port. So if you create a social dialogue with all these companies under the leadership of the president of the port, read the city, we create a social atmosphere of transferring these people to other places. Do you really think that it's complicated to find 200 jobs to 200 operators from one crane to another service in the, in the port? No. If you have a, an open uh, dialogue and if, if the, the city would like to facilitate that. So uh, one of the things you can do, for instance, is just collect 10 cents per container and you create a fund for redistribution, working forces from one place to another place, or to educate people from one type of job to the other one. 10 cents per container. That sounds nothing. But we do in the Netherlands, in the Port of Rotterdam, 15 million containers a year. So that's why I said there's always money. It's how you spend it. If you said, well, I don't need 10, 10 workers, get out. This is the door of, of, my, uh, of my institute. Yes, you get that problem. But if you organize a social dialogue, and all these companies are willing to contribute, and that is the atmosphere that we like, and if needed, the president of the port is going to intervene, and sometimes, if I need it, I will intervene myself. That's how we can redistribute these jobs to other places where they need personnel. And nowadays, it's not an issue because there are uh, 6,000 empty jobs in the port. 6,000 possibilities, so come in. 
I think we're out of time. I'm sorry, um, but I want to thank you. I hope that uh, that your commitment and experience will be shared with other cities who can benefit from it, and certainly Chicago can learn something from Rotterdam. We hope you'll come back soon again and participate in our forum on global cities where we bring many mayors from around the world uh, together to hear your experiences and your wisdom. Thank you so thank much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Satisfied or you have um, um, additional questions, please use my email address. Um, it's, it's open to everyone, and I read my emails always myself. Always myself. Um, that can maybe help to um, come up with an answer. Um, and my email address, you might find it on the website, and maybe the council will deliver it. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Ha, ha, ha.